Hey, gang. You know, I guess you were probably expecting Dr. Jeff Horowitz, but Dr. Jeff Horowitz is having um, computer issues this evening. So you're stuck with me opening up the show. But anyhow, we're very glad to have you here tonight. Tonight's show is sponsored by ADA, uh, ADA Education Group, which is the American Independent Dental Alliance, I believe that's correct. Anyhow, uh, ADA is a great partner of this group, a great uh, supporter of this group. We're very thankful for them. And we're very honored to all be serving as part of their educational group next month in Cancun. And as you know, last week, we had a drawing for a couple of free spots in Cancun. So we look forward to meeting some of our members in Cancun this coming, uh, this next coming month. I know that I'm very excited to be there. The resort looks beautiful. I have a friend that's there right now. They say it's fantastic. So without further ado, I'm Chad Duplantis. Jeff Horowitz will be here shortly. This is Dr. Jennifer Bell, and we are Dennis in the Know, where we bring you the latest and greatest in dental news and education. And our goal is to bring all of you in the know. Hey, uh, how's your week been? Uh, relatively uneventful, I think, uh, just kind of humming along. Um, we are, you know, dealing with some new staffing changes and we're trying to come up with better strategies moving forward. I, I think, you know, I did, I know our guests can talk to us a lot about this tonight. I, we had done a lot of crunching the numbers over the weekend, looking at dental assistance and dental hygiene getting back into um, practice post COVID, but then also just the graduation rates. And it's really concerning um, what we're seeing statistically with, dang it, what we're seeing statistically with the number of new dental schools coming online and new dentists coming on board and not quite seeing the same um, growth of graduates in the dental hygiene world. So um, I, I would imagine most dentists operate around you know, two to three hygienists per doctor. Um, so you'd like to see those new grads who are reflecting that same statistic. So, you know, I'd be open to that discussion to sort of see, but I think this is going to be an ongoing and continuing challenge for, for a while, um, just to be able to fill empty vacancies for offices, um, you know, as they retire or transition careers or whatever. Well, how hard will it be to put somebody new in? I, I, I totally agree. I think, um, uh, I think that, uh, I'm very interested. I shouldn't say, I think I'm very interested to see what happens with hygiene salaries too, um, over the next few years, uh, whether they stay where they're at. Cause I think that they're, they're definitely at a, an all time high right now. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or whether they start to come down, um, what the temp pricing is going to be and, um, it's very, very interesting to see how all that's going to transpire and it is harder to staff and I'd love to see them graduate more hygienists and I'd love to see, uh, more dental assisting programs out there too, because, um, they're going to be in demand as well. So, yeah. And especially uh, states like North Carolina, where the statistics are showing, uh, Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina, we have a, a significantly higher increase in number of dentists coming online here and getting their licensure in North Carolina and just folks in general moving in this direction. And so, um, you know, wanting to make sure support staff is sort of also trending in a similar direction. And if not, what are some of the things we can do to help support that? Or, you know, what do business models need to look like um, if the reality is that, you know, we, won't have enough support staff uh, to operate the way we used to. And I think that's kind of the interesting conversation um, is, you know, wh what does it look like 10 years from now? And will it look like what we thought dental practices and how they operated and, you know, those types of things for the last 30. So. Cause I've got a really good Friday fail this week, something that right. happened in the office today. So I don't need to mention it now. Look for it on Friday fail, because I think it's a really great topic of discussion. Anyway, just a couple of interesting stories that popped up this week. One, uh, there is some information coming out of the American, uh, group of oral surgeons and they are starting to look at uh, these weight loss medications. And to be specific, it is the, hold on, I don't want to, 
It's the GLP-1s or the glucagon-like peptide receptor, like Ozempic and some of the other ones that are out on the market today. Um, these have become incredibly popular. And so certainly, you know, if you're not asking those questions or don't have it on your health history, it's probably time to update to make sure that you're including that as listed um, prescription medications. But it looks like there may be some impact in our world. And they're reviewing now anesthesia uh, ramifications, if you will, for patients who are on these medications. They're already considering drug holidays for patients who are taking the medication not to take it right before or right after you have anesthesia. Now, in this particular article, it doesn't specify what level of sedation we're discussing. Uh, I don't think we're talking about local, uh, but could be mild, moderate, or uh, conscious, or GA. <clears throat> but the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists are starting to look at some of the potential side effects if you're on these medications and you undergo anesthesia, uh, which could include blood clotting and some other um, issues that were starting to pop up on some of these patients. So uh, I do think we may see some updates. So if you are sedating in your office um, and doing that on a more regular basis, you might want to just keep a pulse on the AAOMS um, review. And also, I'm sure the um, the dental anesthesiologist group will also be looking at this as well. So looking at those regulations related to that medication and certainly asking those questions before putting a patient through sedation to make sure there's not going to be any consequence. As of right now, they are at least recommending a drug holiday. If it's one you take daily, not to take it uh, the day before or after surgery. And if it is the week uh, type of medication where you only take it once a week, then they're asking you not to take it the week before. This is for elective surgeries. Obviously, the, the bigger concern or risk here is for those unelective emergency surgeries that pop up. You need to have your appendix taken out. You have a gallbladder issue going on, something like that that comes up. And if you've had the medications, how do they manage those potential complications that could arise from, the, from taking Ozempic and some of the other ones out there? So just a heads up to let you know that this is certainly an ever-evolving area now that these um, particular types of medications have really taken a pretty big hold in the marketplace. Another interesting story that came out of California this week, actually it was right between uh, New Year's and Christmas. Um, a dentist actually died during treatment uh, while treating a patient. He, uh, he collapsed chair side and that was immediately reported to the California uh, medical group, uh, occupational safety health group there, uh, and they're continuing to investigate, but it sounds like it was a massive coronary event, but it certainly does bring up an interesting discussion on uh, you know, what that even looks like and how you handle it. More importantly, um, that you have all of your uh, affairs in order at your practice as well as at your home, um, because these things certainly can come out of nowhere and um, leave both your staff, your team, and your um, family and a bit of a lurch trying to figure out how to manage everything. And unfortunately, in my case, it would be how to figure out my passwords because I'm constantly already locked out. So there would be no way for them to ever get into anything, which would be really unfortunate in the event that I was no longer here. So that's actually a PSA for myself uh, to really work on that and get better. And with that, that's the news. Yeah, I love the segment you did about the GLP-1. Yeah. Man. Everyone is on them. Um, and, and quite honestly, I don't think anybody knows anything about them. They don't. I mean, there is – things like this really <laughs> scare me when when a whole part of the population really just jumps on a, a, a treatment modality only to wait to see, you know, what the ramifications are going to be. I mean – I've had patients whose thyroid, you know, function has dropped out after using it. Um, I, I just think that we're just so quick to put these out. And yes, they, they do a tremendous amount of good for people who have trouble regulating their blood sugar, i.e. diabetics, the, the population that these drugs were meant for. And weight loss was kind of the bonus side effect 
And we've just really taken advantage of that. So I would love to get some experts on um, yeah. maybe in, in that arena and really chat that up more because um, what an interesting topic. Well, it's what happened with bisphosphonate, right? And actually, yeah. I think Tom Viola is doing some lecturing work on Ozempic, I think, and some of those glp ones. So uh, maybe we'll get Tom back. He, he's always a wealth of knowledge for this information. But to be fair, even to Tom and everybody else, a lot of this stuff is so new oh, and yeah. being deployed at such a broad band that um, I, you know, this is going to be a bisphosphonate scenario all over again, where we're learning on the fly what starts to happen to patients uh, either spontaneously or iatrogenically uh, with treatment. And then what do we do to try to solve those negative side effects? So um, in this particular case, uh, we're really talking about some pretty fatal consequences that could result from the medication being being on board at the same time as I, I'm going to assume mostly GA, uh, but probably moderate uh, conscious sedation probably would fall under that as well. Yeah. And and we've already seen there have already been like a tremendous amount of um, of negative effects uh, that have been seen, you know, just shutting down the, the, the lower GI system and uh, yeah. people running, you know, cases of diverticulitis popping up and, and other lower GI disorders getting worse because of it. I know this is not our area of expertise, but way to kind of tie it in with, with the, uh, with the pre-talk that we had, we're just on this whole GI. I know, we're all digested today. today. One last thing, and then we have to bring our guest on. We did make it through yet another competitive round of the Cuspies. So we are down to one of two people, two groups, people for finalists for Influencer of the Year. So we will put out some information, but certainly if you have five seconds and want to hop on drbycuspid.com, um, you can vote for your favorite influencers there and also educators. And there's a whole host of things uh, that you can peruse through. So feel free to do that uh, at your convenience. We would really appreciate your vote. I'm going to tie in um, that our guest is a, is a dental hygienist that lectures all over and, and works with uh, both dentists and other hygienists with her Thrive in the Op program, um, which uh, is an on-demand series. Uh, but I've never, I've never met another colleague that was so in tune with the orosystemic connection. And she really takes it to a completely different level. And, you know, I had the, the pleasure of actually introducing her at one of the ADA events and uh, being able to sit there through her entire program. And, uh, and I'm telling you, even though uh, a lot of the audience were hygienists, there were a tremendous amount of dentists in there as well. And the quality of education that she offered was just, I mean, these dentists were walking out of there raving about why didn't I learn about this? How come nobody's taught me about this? So, you know, on, on more than one front, I love it that there were so many hygienists in there because... That's usually the push for a lot of us is when the hygienist comes back and says, hey, I just learned about all this cool stuff. You know, how are we going to address this with our patients? That's a great pressure. But what's even better is when programs like what we're going to have at Aspire in Cancun, where Amber is going to be talking to the teams, to the doctors and to the hygienist together and the assistants and getting them all excited about not just hygiene, not just how to be productive in the operatory, but really how to make our patients healthier. So um, I know that wasn't your official bio, Amber, but um, thank you for coming on. It is a great pleasure to see you again. Thanks to Ada Education for uh, being a sponsor for Dennis in the Know and for Aspire and for uh, a lot of the programs that, that you're providing. And uh, I, I have one other thing to say is Amber Auger is probably one of the only other people in the world I've ever jumped a train with. <laughs> Do you tell? This is true. Yeah. He hasn't shown you the video yet? 
we put the video up. I would yeah. love to put that on again, though. That was, yeah, that was a great it day. It was hilarious. It's me yeah. being like, I'm not sure. I'm a little scared. And he's like, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Got like my chewy backpack. Really he's like yeah. pulling me through. I'm like, hang on, yeah. I'm not ready. He's like pulling me up. <laughs> yeah. What that was, was this? Day. You didn't, you know about this chat. I know nothing about this. Yes, we were posted on our site. So we were in Kansas City, and um, I was uh, I introduced Amber at the Ada Education event for uh, for Getsy Dental, and um, at the end of the day, we went out with our hosts, and we went to a really cool distillery, and we were sitting there, and we ordered the you know we thought we had it timed out pretty well, but not so much. And uh, we call the Uber or Lyft or whatever. And the only problem is the Uber Lyft is there, but we can't get to the said Uber or Lyft from where we are because there is a big, long train between us and the car that is not moving. And we were so, tight. We were tight yeah. because what had happened is I said, um, I said to Jeff, are we, did you order the, are you ordering the Lyft? And he said, yeah. And then I went downstairs, did some shopping, came back up, and I was like, oh, you ordered it, right? And he was like, oh, I thought you did. So we were like tight, <laughs> tight on time. Continue. Oh, God. <laughs> oh no, you can go ahead. You can finish the story. So essentially what happened is I ordered the lift and I had plans to hang out in the lounge, maybe get another snack before the flight. And it is down. We were hanging out down. with Horowitz. Yeah, we're down to the wire here. So I'm nervous because I like to be. I, I like to have like 30 minute, a 30 minute buffer time where you can grab a snack, use the restroom. If the gate changes, you're not sprinting through the airport. So the train is literally blocking, not moving. And he's like, we got to do this. So we cross over, which I think is absolutely hilarious. Cause the whole time I'm like, I'm not sure what if this starts? Like all I can think of is what if this train starts while we start going? And then I can hear Don being like, this is not a good idea. Like in the back of my head, um, Jeff is all concerned about what music. He's like, it's like Indiana Jones. Can you find the Indiana Jones music? Oh my God. <laughs> so we cross, and when we cross, the Uber driver had literally made it to the other side already. And he was like, you guys cross the tracks? We're like, yeah. But he was a great driver and it all worked out fine. So uh, y'all cross again? Uh, no, he came to us, I believe. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Uh, we were going to yeah. cross again. He was like, please don't do that. Well, <laughs> obviously, if you're here tonight, you made your flight. We, we made, made our flight. Our flight. Was great. Yeah. And we had dinner. Yeah. We What was the restaurant we went to in the Atlanta airport? Uh, oh, um, One Flew South. It's the best restaurant okay. in the Atlanta airport. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll yeah, take we had an adventure. That. It was great. You know, it was. It was a good adventure. But it was cool. Yeah, like, we're like, I'm throwing the luggage up on top of the train and I'm jumping up and I'm like, come on. It was he was fun. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh if you're gosh. ever in a bind, don't worry. He'll get you out of it. That's right. Well, That's right. Uh, you, you all are just crazy. <laughs> well, anyway, Amber, thank you for being on today. Um, and and it so we've got the team together. We're missing Lon. And um, is there one other? Who else? No, it's just it's us. Yeah, it's us and Lon. Or well, Don's missing, of course. Oh, but right. yeah. yeah, but here's your Aspire Cancun team, and um, it's going to be so exciting because really, there's a lot of crossover between what we're all talking about. Um, but Amber, why don't you maybe give a, a little bit of background about yourself and about your interests and then lead into what you're going to be talking about in Cancun with the teams? Absolutely. So I have been a uh, practicing dental hygienist since 2010, and I've held pretty much every role as a hygienist, I've done assisting. I've um, still practice hygiene. I've done. I'm a consultant. Um, so my goal really is to create professionals who really love treating patients, and that comes down, in my opinion, to finding the root cause of why the patient has periodontal disease, why they have caries, and then how we can educate to inform them 
to really be engaged in a preventative protocol. So it's not just, hey, we're gonna fluff and buff while you're here, it's floss, brush, rinse, every hour on the hour you're recommending the same products. Instead, it's really looking at the root cause. Why do they have the caries? Is it a biofilm issue or is it an airway issue? Are they mouth breathing all day long? Uh, what is the TMJ? You know, the TMJ, how is that working? Is there a lot of wear on the teeth? That can be linked to things like sleep apnea and airway disturbance. So are we kind of linking that in? Um, I practice two days a week. And one of the things I love most ab about the clinical care is being able to have the connection made from the patient of what their risk is and seeing that light bulb moment come on um, for the patient. And then getting them to a point where when they're coming in, they're healthier each and every time. So now we can talk more about that medical history. We can have more connections of that family and lifestyle. And my goal is to make those appointments easier every single time that patient comes in, whether it's easy from a debridement standpoint or an emotional standpoint where they're not scared of coming in anymore. Uh, I also have a program called Thrive in the App. So I teach dental hygienists all of the clinical and business skills that they need um, to be successful and be a high producer because the rates of hygiene salaries right now are through the roof. And many hygienists don't know that business side. So I'm happy to provide someone with a high hourly rate if they are producing three to four times that hourly rate at minimum. Um, I do have a slide pulled up because in part of the programs uh, in Cancun, one program I'll be co-presenting with Dr. Lon McRae on the culture of how to hire well, why your hygienists stay, how to keep them engaged, how to create a culture of stakeholders in your practice who are truly invested, and how do you leave that one hygienist who's super excited, maybe it's something like salivary testing, and they wanna kind of test it out in their room, how do you give them leeway without losing complete control of your practice? So we'll be talking about that. In part of those statistics that we're talking about, um, one of the really interesting thing is there was a report done by the ADA and the Health Policy Institute in 2022 have you seen those statistics? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is uh, the statistics like uh, that seem to be the most comprehensive. And for those of you watching who haven't read that, uh, one of the things that I was really going to point out is one third of dental assistants, 33%, and 32% uh, of dental hygienists are expected to retire in our industry in the next uh, five years or less. And what I'm seeing with new grads coming out of hygiene school you can graduate as a hygienist and now you have different opportunities. You can sell online courses. You can be an Instagram influencer, a podcast host. You can be an affiliate with Amazon. So there's not really if your culture of your practice isn't one where there's full time benefits and it's fun to be a part of. It can be really hard to find that full time clinician. Um, and what I know from the work that I've done on the consulting side is there is this trend of if you're part time, you're not fully invested in the practice. So you're less likely to be engaged in the practice protocols and less likely to be accountable to the standards that that practice is setting. So really interesting stuff. But the number one reason that uh, people leave practices is not for the benefits. It's more about the culture of the practice. Well, and we talked about when we when we opened the show, uh, add in the fact that the graduation rate for hygiene has been fairly stagnant, really. Mm -hmm. um, and really an odd statistic. Maybe you understand why, but I mean, I really dove in because I'm like, well, how bad is this going to get? Because the reality is like, I mean, we've posted for a job and you get one application if you're not offering a signing bonus, like all, all these things. And to your point, like it's getting a little bit out of control of kind of, because you don't even know who these people are. And you, again, you're bringing them into your culture. Will they accept your protocols? Will they kind of fit in with your people? All, all of those things. Okay. So all that being said, and I was looking at enrollment into hygiene school and then the graduation rate, like enrollment has gone up a little bit, but still they're not opening the number of programs that we're seeing on the dental side. But then um, graduation rate actually is tapering off because they're not even finishing the program. For whatever reason, mm -hmm. enrollment is going up slightly. So if you're looking at just enrollment numbers, that would be very deceiving because graduation numbers are actually down 5%, mm -hmm. um, which is even more depressing because you're like, okay, great. Well, where are they going to come from? Yeah. 
the one thing that I absolutely love about you is how well you do your homework and your research and how in tune you are with the industry. It's very unique. I feel like we should be calling you the dental reporter <laughs> um, because you're right on. You are 100 percent right on. So here's where I think this is coming from. Number one, dental hygiene programs, the complexities, the stress, it is not an environment where it's a very traumatic environment to go through dental hygiene mm -hmm. school. You are meant to be weeded out. You literally can fail for the day if you didn't have over gloves for wiping your cackle box. Like, how is that even practical to what you're going to be doing? You know what I mean? Like, you're mm -hmm. not going to be taking your cackle box to, to work every day. It, it's just, it's silly. Uh, some of those standards and protocols that we've set in the dental hygiene programs. And I think a lot of them are not set up for the hygienist success. You have to find your own patients, uh, the costs of hygiene school, and there's not always repayment programs. If you look like schools like the University of New England in Maine, where I, I grew up in Maine, so I was looking at this program for a while as a hygienist thinking I could go back to school and I would have pretty much all of my loans paid when they first opened that program. I think it was like 90% of your tuition would be reimbursed if you promise to work in Maine in certain zip codes for up to five to 10 years, but they were literally going to reimburse your entire, um, your entire school. Like that's, a, that's a really cool trade-off, especially if you're from the area and you don't mind the winters and who knows, maybe you could be in Bar Harbor or Acadia, what a great place to be. And if you have that health, that mindset of public health in those rural areas as well, it could be a win-win for you. Those things aren't offered in dental hygiene school. The other thing is the culture. So I started, I um, am 35 years old and I started in dental when I was 15 and the culture when we were 15, when I was 15 as a hygienist, if there was a cancellation, you got time to sharpen your instruments. You could go to the business team and help them try to schedule appointments. You would be filing your paper charts. Now, if there's a cancellation, you're literally, by the time the cancellation happens, it's filled. You don't have admin time built into your schedule like it once was. And there's so much more burden on dentists to, with the ROI to have overhead costs being reduced, looking at profit and loss and insurances, which you do such a great job of covering. That kind of energy flows down to the hygienist. So, and many states are not allowing hygienists to expand in a way that should be expanded. Mm -hmm. So why would you go to school for four years to be a dental hygienist when you can go to school for six and be a nurse practitioner, open up your own practice and not have to apply state by state when you want to move for your license. Damn. So as much as I love dental hygiene and I would practice full time if I didn't have carpal tunnel, I, I love it. Absolutely love it. I don't know if I would do it again, knowing all of the restrictions I would have. Like if Massachusetts, if I could open up my own practice, I'd do it tomorrow. Yeah. So um, I, I want to, as I was saying earlier, and I was kind of complaining about the hygienist salaries to an extent, I, I, I am so glad that you said what you said, because what I really should, the, the problem that we had when we were hiring hygienists is 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 unprecedented hourly rate suggestions with not enough juice to back it you know mm -hmm. i mean there's yeah. just like there wasn't substance there you know mm -hmm. and and you know some of the things that these new grads are being told we talk about inflation already being on the on the rise that's just that's just lowering the take take home of the dentist increasing the overhead and you know if you provide value that's one thing but mm -hmm. if you can't provide the value and I didn't find that there were enough answers in that process. And fortunately, um, I think we, we ended up paying, we, we hired two hygienists this year. Um, and I think we ended up paying a, a, a very good hourly rate. I think it was very competitive, but what I can pride myself in is that they, when they, they joined us for a partial, uh, for a working interview, they both felt the culture was right for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, We've also given them a lot of opportunity to expand within our practice, you know, as far as their duties and, you know, we listen and it's been a great fit, but it, you're right. It's, it, it was a culture issue for them. Right. And I think it the was other thing is, even if you have a high producer in the practice, 
what's the cost to you energetically if that high producer is challenging everything you say and does not have buy into the culture? So I it just takes agree. it just takes one negative egg to impact mm -hmm. that entire culture of the team and to have mm -hmm. one person be like, mm, yeah, I don't know, to then everybody being questioning, oh, okay. Especially if that energy is very much influencing energy. Uh, when we look at, you know, maybe something like the disc profile, um, I'm a high D. So I'm a high DI. So I'm direct, but I also influence. So I have to watch even my tone when I walk into a practice, if, you know, there's been traffic in the morning or if I didn't sleep well and I'm a little bit more cranky, I have to make sure that I'm taming it back so I'm not negatively influencing a team member. So I think a lot of it comes down to not only what you're producing, your emotional intelligence, how well you work with others. Are you going to be somebody who sees a problem and doesn't say anything? Or are you going to be somebody who sees a problem and immediately jumps in, whether that's an overflowing trash can or, you know, watching an elderly patient struggle in the parking lot when there's black ice? Uh, do you run out? Do, do they run out and uh, welcome them in? Things like that go a long way, both for the hygienist and for, you know, the owner of the practice, because as a hygienist who sees things like that and does it, I want to be able to to work in a practice where if I see somebody struggling in the parking lot, I can go ahead and help them. And I'm not, it's not like you sat your next patient late. Well, yeah, but I was seeing another patient struggle. So it's important to have that comprehensive view of things as well. So Amber, I, I think one of the, and again, I'm, I'm kind of the eternal optimist, even though I hated everybody today. I think that whether it's dentistry or hygiene, I see this as there are more and more opportunities for all of us, even on the dental assisting side. So I really think to your point that when you find the practice with the right culture, one that says, find what you love, find what you're passionate about, and let's build on that. Mm -hmm. So you know, for you, it's it's about, you know, the oral systemic connection and, and how to remain productive and, and things like that. You have a lot to offer, but if you're not in a culture that allows you to offer those things, you're stifled. But I think one of the great things about what we're all doing in our official in in joining up and joining forces with the American Independent Dental Alliance is that we're all stressing all of these different areas that will allow dentists to really pursue their passion and to bring along teams that want to do the same thing. So for me, a hygienist is not somebody to, to come in and fluff and buff, as you say. You know, for me, it's like, okay, are you passionate about sleep? Come over, let's, mm -hmm. you know, start screening for sleep for me. If this is what you really love, mm -hmm. I can let you go on your own and you will more than earn your salary. You will more than three to four times mm -hmm. what I'm paying you if you're productive in that mm -hmm. matter. Do you like myofunctional therapy? Go yeah. learn myofunctional therapy. I'll contribute to your education if you promise to stay on for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. I just think that there are so many opportunities and especially mm -hmm. now with everything that, that we're going to be talking about. Um, my lecture in, in Cancun is going to be the, the dental healthcare advocate, which goes right along with what you're talking about, what mm -hmm. Chad's talking about, what JB's talking about. It's how as dentists, we can assume all these other roles and really it's about fulfillment mm -hmm. that, that, that if we can find fulfillment in whatever it is that we're doing, there, there are always going to be people to fill those spots who see a leader mm -hmm. that wants to see mm -hmm. their teammates fulfilled as well. I think the difference here is all three of you, and I'll say four to include Dr. McRae, you have an abundance mindset. You know that it is better for you to go ahead and let go of a team member and ha that is not a good fit, that is changing the culture of the practice that's not in alignment with your vision and keep that space open because you know that it's better to, to fire fast and hire slow and find the right fit. And you know that your team has buy-in of the culture and they will pick up that slack. 
what happens is, is most dentists don't have that abundance mindset. They have a scarcity mindset. So what they do is they have a pretty good culture that then switches over to a much more toxic culture because you leave a team member that is not equipped to be in a role in a role and negatively impacts everybody. Because if you're leaving a team member who's calling out back to back to back to back, if you're leaving a team member who has signs of substance abuse with tools in their hands and being in a room alone with a patient, those are crazy things that happen on a consistent basis from hygienists who are reaching out to me across the country saying, how do I handle this? So there's two different models. The other thing is so many dentists come to me and say, where are all the great hygienists? And I have this community of hygienists who are like, where are all the great dentists? So many of the hygienists in my group would say, oh my gosh, I love Mayo. I would love to do that. Sign me up. So this is what's amazing about the Ada group as well as the Dinks platform is bringing these people together to be able to say, if you're looking for this type of team member, let me help you find that person, no matter what your zip code. Um, and I think that's what's really amazing. We have a member in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, who is in an environment that just was really toxic. Um, her, the owner of the practice would text her all hours of the night, would get really passive aggressive about things. It was, it was ugly. And she was like, I just want to be able to practice my L. Like, I just want to go and I want to find an airway. And I was like, airway, she's like, I want to find an airway practice. And I'm like, we, we can find you one. Like, it's really that easy. Write down all of your non-negotiables and we'll find you one. And she's like, it's never going to happen in zip code. And I was like, I promise you it's going to happen in your zip code. If I have to lose a few hours of sleep, we're going to make this happen. And now she's in her dream practice, literally practicing myo full time. She's a full time schedule, just seeing myo patients. So I think that's what's really amazing when you shift that mindset, when you let go of the good to allow the great in and just align with, you know, what your passion is as, as a provider, because I think it'll be less burnout, more joy and really more fulfillment for your community when you're operating at your highest and truest self. The abundance mentality, because I agree we all three are, but the abundance mentality was a lot easier before COVID. You know, oh, it's, become, it's become a more difficult uh, lean in, not for obvious egregious issues like drug abuse or mm -hmm. chronic uh, no show, that kind of thing, but just general demeanor and that like, little nitpicky stuff mm -hmm. on how things are functioning within an office. Um, knowing that you could certainly let people go and have open positions for six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. it, it's just because that also is an equal burden to your team as well. Like they're right. happy to play their part, but for a certain period of time, and that's across all industries. It's not mm -hmm. dental. I had a guy in today who works for Pepsi and he talked about, one location alone had 50% turnover in one of their manufacturing plants last year alone. How do you deal with, um, you know, that rate of turnover happening so quickly? Everybody that works there is new, like no one is mm -hmm. uh, trained or capable. So, you know, we, I think we are a little more fortunate than that, but definitely it's been more trying, I think, within the last four years or so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would completely agree. And I do think that uh, I think, yes, the past four years, but I would strongly agree with definitely after COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, expectations that have changed, um, you know, on all sides. Um, and, you know, um, it, 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 it's harder to find that culture fit uh, than it has been in the past. And one of the messages that I want to get out is that, you know, you mentioned this about Ada and I'm going to go ahead and reiterate it. And I will say, you know, you talked about how Thrive in the Op can help, but that's being part of a community mm -hmm. is a big part of creating a culture. And if you're a member of Thrive in the Op or you're a member of Ada, not only can groups like that help you find employment, but in f find employment and the right fit. And I think that joining some sort of group like that is a must, especially for a young practitioner um, of any caliber within the dental industry. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think was most refreshing about the ADA course um, that we did most recently in Missouri was 
the watching the energy of the doctors kind of leading into the program and i did a very comprehensive day so we do a little on salivary testing we do airway we do what's the practical for airway I kind of touch on a lot of things i try to go in depth to a point and then continue on because the last thing i want anybody to do in a six hour ce is to be bored uh, and the amount of emails that I got after of saying like, thank you so much. This was really inspiring. This made me see how you can take this in small increments and start to apply it. You don't have to, you know, like scrap everything you're doing and start over. But here, you know, you gave us a roadmap of here's what to begin to integrate in. And that was what was so cool about Ada. The energy in the room was electric. Uh, the uh, feedback from the clinicians was also great. It was so amazing to tangibly feel how excited people were to elevate their standard of care. So I absolutely love this, this course description in a nutshell, I will say, do you, are you doing this for Ada again, this coming year, 2024, which one, which you just spoke about where you do the salivary. Oh, in a nutshell. So I did, this was the dental hygiene detective course. Okay. Um, so I'm in conversation right now with Ada kind of mapping out. I do believe that we've chosen a guts, gum, and glucose course that I'm doing. Um, I've also presented It's Not You, It's Your Saliva for Ada. Um, but the one that I just kind of re was talking about is the dental hygiene detective course. So we pull Great. in a lot of risk assessments. We talk about why that patient, the foods and the beverages that they drink that can increase the pH. It's a lot of pH testing. Uh, we go through what the pathogens mean and what products works best based off the pathogen. We go over things like four dice granules and how that's linked to high triglycerides. Um, so we have a lot of fun. There's a lot of clinical cases in there. We show, I'll disclose and show the clinical cases and then say, what products would you recommend based off of this patient now that we've disclosed them and you can see the acidic blue, you can see the struggle in the posterior, but the tight lips. So we can't recommend a large toothbrush there. We'd wanna do more of a compact and really walk the hygienist through the thought processes of here's how you create diversity in your schedule, uh, not only from the procedure standpoint, but from what you're recommending. So the patient has patient specific products because once they know you're recommending this specifically because of X, they'll be more apt to use it. And, and tell me how patients kind of ahead, this already, but tell me how patients respond when you actually have a medical conversation about a dental uh, existence issue that's mm -hmm. going on. And, you know, and the common response is, I mean, I brush and floss every day and blah, 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 blah. And, mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, but you can always feel their shoulders like sort of let go a little bit because yeah. some of that ownership is off of, like that guilt that they seem to be yeah. carrying around that embarrassment, shame, mm -hmm. like you're giving it a diagnosis, you're giving it a, a thing that is bigger than they are, mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah, so it's all about how you present it to the patient, of course. So historically, dentistry, we've shamed patients into compliance. So if you don't do X, this is going to happen. If you don't do this crown, your tooth is going to fracture, you're going to split it, you're going to need an implant. If you don't go ahead and do the periscalings, all of your teeth are going to fall out. So patients are accustomed to want to be shamed the moment they sit down in the chair. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say want to. They're they're getting ready and preparing themselves to be shamed no matter what answer they've they been preconditioned they've been pre exactly exactly so let's say i have a patient that comes in i'll go through their medical history we'll take blood pressure we'll do chief concerns and then i'll say tell me what is your home care routine looking like sometimes they're like what do you mean my home care routine i'm like how are you taking care of your teeth and gums and we go through that oftentimes patients will be like I'm like, how's the water flosser? Oh, I'm not using it. I bought it, but I never opened the box. That's a moment right there for me to either build trust or immediately throw them under the bus and lose all trust that I tried to build last time. So instead of doing the, I can't believe you didn't open the, the box, I go through and say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you have it. After today, you'll have a fresh start and you can maintain what we do here today by using it. Let's review how to use the water flosser correctly. M's on the top teeth, W's on the bottom. You've got the cordless one, so you can use it in the shower. It's going to be fantastic for you. I'm super excited to hear your feedback on it. Next thing. So then from there, once we go through that process, we do uh, the overall films, whatever they may need. Then I disclose. The disclosing now becomes the true serum. And I let them hold up the mirror and they tell me where they need to do better. And we go through why the plaque is there. 
it's never you sucked at using X product, even though sometimes I want to say that, right? Or you're, you are using the electric toothbrush. Have you turned it on? Because clear, did you put it to the tooth? Because we're something is wrong here. Instead, it's okay. Let's figure out how you're using the product. Let's modify it. Or hey, you're putting your aligners in without rinsing them out after. Maybe you're they're brushing with the handle. They could be. It's exactly. Fuzzy. Wrong end. Exactly. So it <laughs> yeah. all comes down to that. So if I'm seeing something like a uh, four-day granules when I'm assessing, I say to the patient in a really nonchalant manner. You know, I'm seeing these areas. Let me show you what they look like. They're a little yellow. They look like these little, almost like um, pimples on your, on the inside of your tissue. This can be a sign of a high lipid. When you go to your PCP, I just want to make sure you get annual blood work. Just bring that up to them. I see a yellow palette that could be anemia. I see a swollen tongue that could be like a B12 deficiency. So nothing super serious. However, I do want to get this evaluated for you. And then it immediately becomes like, oh, you notice that? No one's ever told me that. Oh, you're really thorough. Oh, you're like a detective. And that's how the dental hygiene detective course got built. Um, but I've trained my patients to always expect something new in the room every time they come or some new knowledge, um, because that makes it fun for both of us. I never want to be into a process where I'm seeing them every three months and they feel like they don't need me anymore. They don't, they don't have value for that three-month recare. I'm always trying to add more things in so that they don't stay stagnant from an inflammation standpoint, but also they, they are challenged and have, we have good conversations and can maintain that rapport. So Amber, as you know, given that, that I had the opportunity to, to help host that event with you, um, it was really neat for me to watch the excitement as well, because in all of this talk about ADA and developing an educational platform for ADA, which, you know, Don and I have been, you know, going back and forth about this, it's how excited can we get dentists about getting outside of the comfort zone of what they've been doing? To, to Jennifer's point, we could really pick and choose whatever it was that we wanted to do, whatever we liked. And we could get away with just about anything pre-COVID. After COVID, it seems like we're just all lumped into this box where we're trying to compete with all the big box stores. And we don't have to. So part of what's really cool about ADA and what we're going to be talking about in Mexico and what we're going to be talking about, you know, quite frankly, for the next few years is... How do we allow dentists and hygienists and assistants to find all of these other areas that impact our patients that allow us to almost subspecialize, to change our practices, to change our cultures from within? And what was really cool for me was even though you had a really large group of hygienists, the dentists that were in that room watched those teammates get really, really excited. And they're like, wait a minute. They're excited about doing saliva testing. They're excited about checking airways. They're excited about talking about, you know, oral systemic connection. They're excited about talking about the joint. I could really make this a part of my practice, but it's going to take some work on my part too. So I, I think that's where we all kind of have an opportunity to work together and, and continue to help dentists to find what it is that excites them because there really are a lot of other areas in dentistry that, that we can be pursuing to differentiate ourselves from the big box stores. I think this is a, a great opportunity time for dentistry. And, um, and, and it's people like you on the screen and, and like Lon McRae and, and forward thinking companies like, you know, all of the, uh, the, the distributorships of, of Ada and, and Don Metcalf. I'm just really excited to be a part of all of that. And I'm excited that you're a part of it, Amber. Oh, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And especially to do it alongside all of you. It means even more. Same. Well, we certainly look forward to seeing you. And I, I've got to tell you a funny story because you you hit home a little while ago when you talked about the water flosser. We have this elderly gentleman that's been coming to us. And I mean, his 
oral health has really gone down just because he can't take care of it anymore. So we recommended a water flosser and electric toothbrush. So two weeks later, he comes back for a couple of fillings and he has a Coles bag with him and he sits down in the chair and he goes, I need somebody to show me how to use this. I don't know how to use this damn thing. <laughs> so, you know, of course you're like, okay. So I asked the hygienist, I was like, look, Hey, I'm running a little behind. You don't have a patient. Could you run in there and help Mr. <laughs> you know, so-and-so with his, with his uh, electric flosser? She says, absolutely. She comes out about two minutes later. She's like, I have no idea how to use the damn thing. And I was like, oh, it can't be that hard, you know? So I go in there and I plug it in and I pull out the instructions and look at him behind his back. And I'm like, okay, you do this, 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 and this. I turn it on and water's shooting all over the room. I mean, it is going everywhere. And I just put the thing down on the handle and my assistant looks at me like, he's never going to be able to get this. And I said, you know what? I got an idea. Where did you get this from? I have no idea. I just bought the damn thing. Well, it came in a Kohl's bag. Did you get it at Kohl's? No, I didn't get it at Kohl's. I don't know where I got it. I just can't use the damn thing. I said, well, I tell you what. I reach up and I just grab a brand new toothbrush that was just sent to me that day. And I was like, here you go. I'd like to give this as a gift to you. This is an electric toothbrush. We're going to start here. And we're going to talk about that water picker, you know, water flosser next time. But let's just start here. And I know how to use this. So uh, I get it. But hell it's sometimes even hard for me to figure out these things so so funny i wonder if a washer was gone or something it was shooting water literally eight feet that's so interesting that shouldn't have happened and and it was like i was the first person to put water in it there was no dial to turn it down and i yeah. mean it was like a gusher and you were you're right maybe a washer because it <laughs> and, was a yeah stream. that's not normal I mean, it was, yeah it was that's not normal. across the room yeah. so um, oh, I didn't see anything like it, but Both of uh, you. <laughs> I was, I was, I was very wet when it was, when it was done from trying to shut it off. And oh, turn right. it around. Yeah. Today so. when my assistant was leaning on the air water syringe and wasn't paying attention and like we were looking at each other and it was sh shot the patient right in the yeah. forehead and she never noticed. So I was like waving my arms, like, please get up, get off the air water syringe and Water's dripping down the patient's face. Yeah, been there. Just another day in my room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> been there with the air polisher. I'm always a little. Wear an air, wear a <laughs> That's all I can say. Well, all right, gang, we better wrap it up. Wonderful, Jeff. I'm going to let you close tonight since I opened. Okay, why not? Welcome to Dennis in the Know. This is your backstage pass for cutting no. I don't know how to do the back end. I do the front end. Anyway. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Ada Education. Thank you, Ada Group and the companies that make up Ada, which are Atlanta Dental, Nashville Dental, Midwest Dental, and Getsy Dental. And uh, all great companies. Thank you, Don Metcalf, for putting Ada Education together. I can't wait for Mexico. Lots of great stuff for all of us together, lots of great things ahead for the independent dentist. So with that, we will say good night and we wish you a great week and don't hate everybody. It's not good for the soul. I'm just going to do that for tonight. So there you good go. night, everybody. And that wraps up another podcast for Dennis in the Know. On behalf of Dr. Jennifer Bell, Dr. Chad Duplantis and myself, Remember that we've got a great profession, so let's make it a great day, Dinks.